Hello, welcome to the faculty conversation on leadership. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us. I'm Alan Lind. I'm a professor uh, of leadership and management here at Fuqua, uh, and I look forward to our conversation today. Uh, a few points. Um, first, you can submit questions to me um, via Twitter if you want. The, um, the, the hashtag is um, number sign Fuqua alumni, F-U-Q-U-A, A-L-U-M-N-I. And as those questions come in, they'll be handed to me and I'll try to respond to them. What I'd like to do today is talk to you about um, a research study that I did not too long ago uh, on leadership. Um, but I'm also open to answering other questions that you might have uh, about leadership issues. And I may talk to you a little bit about other research that, uh, that I've done uh, in the area. The research that, um, that is the focus of our session today has to do with how leaders in new situations can very quickly establish their leadership potential. It's based on a series of studies that I did with a colleague here at Fuqua, Sim Sitkin, and with two scholars um, at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, at least that's where they were then, um, Anik Jansen and Lester Levy. The study looked at whether there exist, to use a term of art, leadership heuristics. The idea being, is there something um, in human psychology that makes people especially likely to be seen as the leader of a group or a team? Um, the four of us looked at data from a number, of, uh, uh, a number of cultures, a number of different nationalities, all using a Leadership 360 instrument that we use all the time here at Duke uh, in our courses. And what we were interested in seeing was, could we identify some characteristics of leaders that prompted their direct reports and their peers to, um, to quickly assume they were ready to lead or assume that this is someone I would want to follow. We looked at three different characteristics. And if you've watched the video, this is, this is review, but, uh, but it'll get us started. So. Um, we looked at three different possible um, characteristics or actions of leaders uh, that might establish their leadership quite quickly. We looked at um, whether the leader seemed to be treating those he or she led um, fairly. Uh, we looked at whether the leader was seen as sharing the values of the team, in fact, typifying the values of the team. And we looked at whether the leader um, behaved in such a way as to show that his or, her, um, his or her fate, his or her outcome was tied to team success. Um, the term we used was, um, was, was leader dedication or leader self-sacrifice for that third, that third issue. Now we looked at responses, um, ratings of leaders, um, and these are ratings that were collected in, uh, in Fuqua um, executive MBA courses or open enrollment courses, as well as in other, um, uh, other training contexts around the world. It, it's, in fact, entirely possible that some of you contributed to that data, because I know a few of my, my former students and perhaps some of Sim's former students are, uh, are watching the, uh, the conversation today. So um, this might be your data that I'm talking about. What we found was that across all of the cultures we looked at, and we examined um, leaders in the United States, of course, but also in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and, so, and the former Soviet uh, Union and republics, um, and in India, in China, and in New Zealand. Um, we found that in all of those contexts, responses to leaders did, in fact, show these heuristics. They did, in fact, show these almost shortcuts, um, almost automatic leadership um, phenomena, processes um, in, in a variety of organizations. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what each of these shortcuts involved. Um, and, and I don't want to say that they're shortcuts in terms of deception or anything. They're actually, when you think about it, quite reasonable ways to assess whether someone is a good potential leader. We knew from a great deal of work that we had done in the past, including much of my academic work, that fairness is a big deal in leadership. If I'm going to follow someone, 
I want some assurance that they're going to treat me in a straightforward, transparent, unbiased fashion. Um, we knew that, um, that, in fact, fairness was the one heuristic that had been established in other studies prior to the one I'm talking about. So we knew that fairness could operate to make people especially willing to accept someone else's authority. In the research, what we found was that if a leader um, if someone, the target of this 360, uh, was seen as fair, then their, their, leadership, um, their leadership potential, their, the, the ratings that they received in terms of the quality of their leadership, the level of trust that was invested in them, um, all of these things went up sharply. Now, fairness, um, I should mention, is not just a matter of pay. In the research um, that I and other scholars do on fairness in organizations, fairness is a matter of respect. Uh, it's a matter of showing concern and lack of bias towards those you deal with. Um, it's, uh, fairness is promoted, for example, very strongly by listening to people and showing that you're really understanding what they're saying. Um, fairness is um, uh, is demonstrated by you making the effort to connect with them. Um, in, in the video, I think I, I used Nelson Mandela, the great South African leader, as an example of how concern, respect, and fairness can, um, can, can have massive impact on, uh, on one's leadership potential. Um, Mandela um, was and is famous for his his, his actions that connect with, with those he leads. So even when he was uh, a prisoner of the, uh, of the apartheid regime in South Africa, he made remarkable efforts to connect with those around him, even to connect with his jailers. Um, and there's a great quote that Mandela has uh, that, that goes to one of his actions. So Mandela, when he was imprisoned, uh, decided he needed to learn the language of his jailers, the Afrikaans language that his jailers spoke. Um, and when asked, why would you do this, he said, if you want to, um, if you want to converse, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, if you, if you want to converse with someone, speak to them in a, in, in a language that you both understand. But if you want to persuade someone, speak to them in their own language. And I think whether we're talking in terms of actual language differences or metaphorical language differences, it's a great lesson in terms of showing respect and concern uh, and fairness. If you can reach people, um, if you want to reach people and reach them quickly, find a way of connecting with them that shows your, your respect for, for where they're coming from. Anyway, that's one, that's one heuristic and a, quite a powerful one. Um, the other heuristics uh, involve, in the first instance, uh, 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 a set of actions uh, that demonstrate, and I'll use a term of art here in the science, something we call prototypicality. If you want to connect with people in a team or in an organization, show, to, show them how you exemplify the values that they most care about. Um, make a connection to them in terms of, in terms of their values. Um, and then the, the third leadership heuristic um, that, uh, that we discovered in the study that I'm speaking of has to do with showing people that you're not asking them to make sacrifices for you. You're, make, you're asking everyone to make sacrifices, including yourself, to make sacrifices for the, for the team as a whole. That's a real quick summary of the research. Um, and uh, a large part of, uh, of, of what I want to communicate to you is that there are these ways to make a quick connection with the people that you lead. Let me encourage you, if you have questions, to tweet them in to us. Um, uh, you know, I'd be happy to turn this more into a conversation. Um, those of you who, who've been my students in the past, especially in the distance courses, uh, in the IMBA in the courses, uh, know that I, that I enjoy the back and forth at a distance. Um, but for that to happen, you have to, you have to send in some you have to send in some questions. So by all means, do that. Um, and, and I want to remind you that I'm not restricting the topic to just questions on this research study. That I'm happy to take on uh, questions in, uh, in general uh, about, about leadership. 
um, as 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 you think about leadership, let me let me reflect on some topics that, again, those of you who have been my students will will remember, but those of you who haven't might might find interesting. <clears throat> the approach to leadership training that we take here at uh, at at Duke and Fuqua. Um, looks at leadership as a set of skills that exercises uh, that, that you exercise when you're in a in a in a leadership role um, there was once upon a time uh, the idea in the academic study of leadership that leadership was a trait that that there were personality traits that made one more likely to be a leader um, our work doesn't bear that out nor does the work of, of scholars and in uh, other institutions um, Instead, we find that leadership is part of a relationship, um, that it has to do with, um, with your actions guiding those around you, and that we can be quite specific about what you need to accomplish to be seen as a leader. Reflect back on the research study that I was talking about. One of the, um, uh, one of the primary um, findings there was that when we described each of these heuristic behaviors, so when we described, um, uh, when, when we assessed uh, how fair a leader was or, uh, or the extent to which a leader showed the values of the people around them or the extent to which a leader was making sacrifices for the group, when we assessed those issues, we, we could assess, it in term, assess, them in, uh, assess them in terms of quite specific actions. So um, on the fairness uh, dimension, for example, just asking people, does, does your leader listen to you? Or um, it, does your leader make fairness and, uh, and transparency a priority? Um, just asking about these actions was sufficient to tell us whether the leader was exercising the, the heuristic, was, was making this, uh, this shortcut happen. Um, we have, we've taken this sort of information and, uh, and pushed it forward in our leadership training here so that we, we work to build quite specific skill sets for leaders. Um, and our finding, quite strongly, is that if you exercise these skill sets, uh, corresponding aspects, uh, you, get, you get corresponding responses from those you lead. So if you do the fairness thing, you get back from your people trust. If you do the, um, the dedication thing, the sacrifice thing, or if you do the value congruence, the value sharing thing, um, you get back a lot of credibility from the people you lead. Um, and this in turn lets us be quite specific about how you should lead in, in, in various settings. Um, what I want you to think about, or what I would invite you to think about, is how do you exercise each of these um, qualities? How do you show each of these qualities? Uh, think about your version of fairness. Think about your version of um, showing that you share, you share values, or your version of showing that you are as dedicated to the success of the team as you are to your own success and ask yourself, um, am I doing this in a way that is clear and unambiguous to the people I lead? Um, one, of our, one of our challenges um, when we lead is to push the, the leadership communication out to those around us. Um, and that in turn invites us to consider, is our message getting through? as clearly as it might. Again, let me remind you that you can tweet questions in if you have any. Um, uh, you, can, um, uh, you can ask about issues in terms of starting a new leadership context. You can, um, uh, you can ask about uh, the challenges that we face as we follow leaders. Um, I've often thought that though we teach classes in leadership, we, we really um, teach both leadership and followership because one of the, one of the issues that we, um, that we address routinely uh, in my classes, in Sims classes, in other classes in leadership here at Fuqua is 
how can we how can we be active and engaged uh, as followers as well as as leaders? Let me let me branch to um, a discussion of more recent research that we've done around leadership um, that builds on the um, the leadership heuristic study that I described in the in the video. We're working here to look uh, at uh, at how we can define uh, leadership uh, actions and how we can um, how we can prescribe the actions that are necessary to create each of a number of responses on the part of followers. I'll give you an example. Well, I've already given you the, the example of fairness and trust. So we've done, Sam and I have done a fair amount of research looking at how leaders can engender trust on the part of those they lead. And the finding is that leaders who, um, who, who enact fair processes, who treat people in an unbiased fashion, can engender trust. But also, leaders who demonstrate their understanding of the people they lead um, are, are trusted. Leaders who uh, who, who demonstrate their concern and respect for those they lead are trusted. I mentioned um, to, go to, to go to another category of leadership that um, leaders who show that they share the values of those they lead are given additional credibility. Leaders who show their dedication are given additional credibility. Um, leaders who demonstrate that they are thoughtful and that they're working hard to anticipate the future are given additional credibility uh, in their leadership context. Those are just two examples of how we're linking leadership actions to leadership effects. Um, and if we have time, I'll describe more, more of those connections. But what I point, want to point out is that um, something that's quite interesting and I think rather unique about the way we approach leadership here at, here at Fuqua is that we don't say go out and be a good leader and we don't even say if you do all of these leadership actions you will get back these various good things from your followers you'll get back credibility and trust instead we try to provide a quite specific cause and effect sort of model of leadership I think I'm just getting a, a question and I'll turn to it in just a second um, that means that if you, if, you, uh, uh, if you work from the model of leadership that we have here, you can almost diagnose the, the leadership needs of your unit and respond with leadership actions that, um, uh, that, are, um, that are likely to provoke the, the response you need. So if, you're, if your team isn't showing enough initiative, um, if, if you take our model, if you work from our model of leadership, you can, you can arrive at quite specific activities that you might undertake to improve the initiative um, that's shown in your team. I, I'll come back to that question, uh, to that issue in just a moment. Um, I, have, I, have a, I have a question uh, here from, from Jamie Coates that says, um, uh, what are more examples of showing shared values, don't you first need to understand the values of your employees? Yes, you do. Um, I think that, um, well, let me answer the last part of that question first and then come back to how you show that you share their values. Um, I mentioned that we don't look at leadership so much anymore as a personality trait, that we look at it more as one role within a relationship. and. Given that model of leadership, given that approach to leadership, um, you have to understand the other parties to the relationship. You have to understand them at, at some fairly, fairly deep level to be able to connect with them. Um, if, I'm, if I'm taking on a, a, a leadership assignment with a, with a new team, then I would argue that one of my first tasks is to begin to um, expand my, my understanding and my appreciation of their values. 
um, there's a there's a listening technique that we often um, uh, we often teach in our in our leadership classes here that we call relational listening, um, and it's a form of active listening where you would go to all of the people that you were leading and invite them to talk about issues of importance to them, then listen to what they're saying, and seek to uh, seek to reflect back to them your understanding of what they're saying. So, um, if I were uh, if I were taking on a the, the chairmanship of a new faculty committee, for example, um, one of the things I might do at the first meeting would be to invite the people who are involved, people who are on the committee, to talk about um, the the task that faced us. And I would be listening not just for what they what they what their recommendations were, but for what are the values behind those recommendations. Where can I find some common ground, even with those I might disagree with, um, in terms of values? Uh, it might be the case, for example, um, that I that I disagreed with somebody about how to accomplish something that the, the committee was charged to do or, or to take on some task that the school faces. But if we shared the same values, um, on, on any level, we could find a common ground to work from there. Um, the, the idea that you would let people talk to you about um, how to approach the problem that they face and listen not just for the surface answer but for the deeper values component um, is, I think, one of, the, one of the key elements that you'd want to undertake in, in trying to understand the, the values of the people you face and how to um, how to show your communality with that. I'll give you an example from a case we, we use sometimes in the leadership um, courses. Um, when, um, when Executive Meg Whitman took over um, eBay uh, as its CEO, she was brought in to bring business expertise to what was at that time a startup company. Um, and I thought she was she was very clever in how she did it as a leader. She was, she was, a, she was smart in, in arriving at an understanding of what the values were of this new organization she was, she was entering. She went around to the various um, units um, of, of what was then a, a much smaller company than it is now. And instead of telling them what to do, she asked them to tell her about their, their work and about what, uh, about their successes, about their challenges. And she listened behind the conversation. Certainly she learned a lot from the technical staff about how the eBay servers ran, but she listened behind that conversation uh, in her mind to what, what's dictating what's important to these people? What values do I hear in their, uh, in their, in their, in their responses to me? Uh, and that enabled her later to show how she was, in fact, uh, meeting those uh, uh, values, uh, reflecting those values. Now, once you've arrived at an understanding of what are your shared values, then one thing to think about is how do I, sh how do I communicate that I share these values? How do I communicate that I'm, um, that I'm concerned about some of the same things these people are concerned about? And the answer is, you do it through your behavior, you do it through, through the words you use, you do it through, um, through the way you lead. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, a sort of standard thing that everyone does in leadership courses, uh, which is to play Martin Luther King's great I Have a Dream speech. Um, it's a very inspiring speech, and one of the things I invite my students to do is to think about why. Why does this speech connect with me? What, is the, what are the elements of this speech that, uh, that reach out to me? And as you, as you listen to Dr. King's speech, one thing you notice is that he's putting out, not, in, not by saying it, it explicitly, but by the way he talks about, um, uh, about the, his movement, the civil rights movement in the United States, and the way he talks about what he wants to see in his dream, he's advancing this in terms of values that connect him with the people that he's reaching to. Um, so Dr. King will say, um, we need to do this in essence because this is part of, part of, 
part of the American dream. He uses that phrase. Uh, we, we need to we need to reach for equality because of that's because that's who we are. That's what makes America uh, the nation that it is. And in doing that, he's saying my values and your values connect. Um, there's a there's a part of the speech where he says, um, I, I want I want a dream of a world where, where my children are judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And I often, uh, when I use the case to teach, say, this is an example of how you want to reach out to, uh, to show shared values with the people that you're, uh, that you're leading. Uh, in, that, in that phrase, Dr. King was speaking as a parent to other parents and saying, I care about my children, and the implicit message is you care about your children too. You can understand where, where, we, where we share these values. So what I want to invite you to do in terms of shared values is to look for opportunities to show that what's important to you is what's important to them. Um, uh, if, if, you can dim, if, if a value of your team is innovation, then you want to show that you get excited about innovation. Um, you want to you want to praise innovation. You want to you want to be happy when you see an innovative solution, um, and in doing that, you're showing that this is a value that you share with the people on your team who are being creative. Um, so look to ways in your behavior that you can demonstrate um, your excitement about what they're what they're excited about. I have a, a couple of other questions coming in. Um, from Matthew Miner in a, in a sales management role, how do you balance fairness to customers, dealers with differing capabilities and my employer? Um, I, I think, Matthew, that's the, that's the key element of fairness is to show um, that you are, you are giving to each of these um, sets of people what you owe to them. Um, in, in a sales situation, I think the key to fairness is to say, what exactly, um, what exactly does, does the sales relationship dictate and how can I demonstrate that I'm doing that in an even-handed and straightforward fashion and, and as, as transparently as I can. Um, the, the, nature of, the nature of sales, whether, you, whether you're the salesperson or whether you're managing salespeople, is to say, I want you out there promoting the product in a... Um, uh, in a way that's good uh, for us, the company, and in a way that builds a good relationship with, with potential customers. Um, think about how you can demonstrate that you are, a uh, 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 phrase comes to mind, a straight shooter, you know, that, you're, that, that people can trust what you have to say to them um, because you, you respect them enough to give them um, the information that they need and to fulfill your role in the, in the proper fashion. Um, where I see problems arise in, in sales management or in other, other situations in organizations with respect to fairness, sometimes, of course, there's bias. Sometimes, of course, power or politics or stereotypes or prejudice play out in ways that undermine um, fairness. And, and remember the fairness that's important is the fairness inside the head of the person you're trying to you're trying to connect with. Um, you may think you're being fair, but what really matters is do they think you're being fair? So sometimes the, the unfairness is a, is a bias that you have to, a real bias that you have to protect against. Sometimes the fairness question turns on, am I perceived to be biased? Um, are there connections that people are suspicious of? Am I, uh, am I giving the appearance of fairness as well as the reality of fairness to everybody concerned? Um, when I talk to, uh, when I talk to my, uh, you know, my, um, my various dealers, let's say, am I being upfront about, um, I want you to succeed um, I'm, going to, I'm going to help you to the extent you're, you're capable of using my help or, or not help you if you don't need it. And do we share this fundamental goal of having, having you and, and my organization successful? Um, I think that um, sometimes we err, 
uh, in, in doing fairness in that we don't, um, we don't understand that others may be suspicious of our motives. So a large part of doing fairness uh, is uh, let me show you exactly what I think you, ha you're, you, 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 what you have a right to expect from me and let me be very clear about, um, uh, about the nature of, uh, of, of our relationship, the nature of what I, what I can do for you. Um, now, fairness, yes, as your question suggests, often involves trade-offs, and I think that the trade-offs that happen with fairness, which I'll admit you sometimes need to make, have to be undertaken with a, with a, with a mindfulness, with a consideration that if you're perceived to be unfair, um, a lot of your capacity as a leader will be drained away. Um, it, the, the cost of unfair treatment is huge in organizations. It transforms the nature of the relationship from one that is promotive and cooperative to one that is competitive and sometimes even vindictive. Um, it's a, it's a, I, I have to guard myself against going on and on about this because this is my particular area of, of research over a great deal of my career. Uh, but I can say that um, in negotiations, for example, um, a hint of unfairness can result in, um, in a remarkable decrease in the efficiency and effectiveness of negotiations. People become remarkably uncooperative when they think you're treating them unfairly. On the other hand, the positive aspect of, uh, the positive fallout of fairness is that if people think you're fair with them, they will. Uh, to go back to the heuristic idea that, that I started the session with, they'll almost automatically trust you. So building this, this aura of fairness, building uh, a, an impression of fairness in all of your actions is, is remarkably important, I think, to, to, uh, to our effectiveness as leaders. Uh, another question um, from um, Wambiki uh, Fabian. How much is leadership inherited as a compared to being acquired through learning? Um, it's a good question. I, uh, let me answer it this way. I think that there are, I think that leadership involves skills. They're complex social skills, um, but they're skills just like physical skills, just like intellectual skills. Um, and just like physical skills or intellectual skills, there's variability between people. And some of that variability might come uh, from inheritance. Uh, some of it might come from previous experience. Um, I, I will tell you that I have no doubt that, um, you know, if I walked onto a playground uh, of, you know, people in their, their fifth year primary school, there'd be some people who are more effective leaders than others. Um, just as there'll be some, some children who can run faster than others and some who can throw a ball better and, uh, and some who can do arithmetic problems better. I will tell you also, though, that um, I've taught now literally thousands of people uh, in leadership classes, and I've never encountered a single one who could not improve their leadership. Um, their, uh, if, we, if we use this comparison to physical skills um, and, uh, and the idea that some children run faster than others, um, it's certainly the case that if you took any of those children and set up a program of training and conditioning that would improve their, um, improve their running, you would see a remarkable difference. In fact, some of the children who are, are much slower now could, could learn to run faster than some of the children um, who, you know, when you went, went onto the playground initially, were the fastest, the fastest kids there. It's the same with leadership. I have seen people who develop their leadership skills in quite a deliberate, careful way um, and become fantastic leaders. Now, that said, I will also say that one of the great, um, um, one of the great findings, one of the great uh, implications of, of modern uh, research on leadership is that each of us has to find our own way to do that, uh, to, to exercise those skills. Um, uh, each of us has to look at our own particular strengths, weaknesses, personality, 
and find a way to exercise the leadership actions that we need to we need to do through that personality. Uh, again, I, you know, going back to the metaphor of of running, just as each of us runs a little bit differently. If you ask a if you ask a track coach um, uh, who's trained a lot of people in uh, in in racing, they'll tell you each each runner's stride is a little bit different, each runner's body is a little bit different, and the development of uh, the development of speed and expertise in running has to be tailored to the person. I believe absolutely that's true with with leaders as well. So, um, how much of it is inherited as compared to um, to being acquired through learning? Um, the answer uh, I don't I don't have a percentage answer for you. I would say that there that, that a guesstimate would be that uh, you know twenty to thirty percent of the variation in leadership is due to personality differences, um, and and those are fairly stable things that we we're, we're either born with or grow up with, um, but uh, but. In every case, we can become better leaders, and even those who are quite talented can become still better leaders if they if they if they apply their their mind and their uh, and their efforts to it. Uh, another question from Larry Forbes. Hello, Larry. Um, we've communicated a little bit recently, but haven't um, haven't uh, talked in ages. Larry Larry was a student in my in my Gimba ninety nine class. Um, and has gone on to do, do to do wonderful things in terms of uh, uh, in terms of leadership conversations uh, on his own. Um, Larry's question is: How does a leader um, not overachieve your heuristics and not seem phony? Um, uh, it goes to a point I was just making in 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 response to um, Wambi, let me get the name Wambiki's um, uh, question uh, about how we need to do things in our in our own style. Um, I think Larry that the the issue that we face is how exactly can we enact these heuristics and be ourselves. Uh, let me let me talk about the um, let me talk about the, the shared value uh, example. Um, if I tried to pretend I held values that my team didn't, uh, I think I would quite quickly be perceived to be a fake to be phony about it. Um, if, on the other hand, I look to the values that we do share and start building from that, or if I do some hard thinking about how their values um, are important ways to achieve the goals that we that we face, and, and in essence, convince myself of the importance of those values. Uh, and work from that, then I'm able to I'm able to enact those values in a way that um, uh, that that is you know that 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 seem quite convincing. Um, uh, as I talk about this, I'm reminded of of two kind of classic leadership examples um, uh, of on the one hand successful um, uh, enactment of of shared values, and on the other hand a, a less successful one. Um, there's a story I like to tell. And Larry, I may have told it when, when you were in my Gimba class um, about the CEO of uh, uh, the then CEO of Continental Airlines, uh, Gordon Bethune. When Bethune took on his leadership role at Continental, they were they were in very bad shape, and he was interested in turning the airline around. Uh, but he had to establish his leadership as he did that. Um, one of the one of the things that uh, the Continental did as part to, as part of their effort to rebrand themselves was to repaint all their airplanes with a different color scheme and logo, um, and that meant that the airplanes had to be repainted overnight because you don't take a, a hundred million dollar piece of equipment out of out of service uh, during its serv during during times when you could be using it um, to make money. Uh, he had to ask the mechanics. Um, at Continental to put in extra hours to repaint the airplanes. Um, but Bethune did it in a very clever way. He, he showed up um, at, um, I think it was at Midway Field uh, in Chicago in overalls, went to the crew chief and said, give me a paintbrush and let me show, uh, and let, let, me, let me go out there and paint the airplane. What, what he was trying to do was to show his, uh, his value connection with the, with the the change he was advocating, and his respect and concern, and his uh, his shared values with the with the people that he was asking to work for him. 
uh, it was quite effective. He, Bethune had a tremendous reputation at Continental by the time, by the time he left uh, the office. Um, it wasn't phony because Bethune knew airplanes. Bethune had been a pilot. He'd worked at Boeing. He was not, he was not unfamiliar with the, the tasks that he, was, that he was asking the mechanics to, to undertake, and, and he, was, he was not unfamiliar with, uh, with the, the, the chores that he was willing to undertake in this kind of demonstration of, of shared concern about turning the organization around. Um, a less successful example, often cited uh, 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 in, in political leadership discussions, uh, involves some of, um, some of um, uh, Senator John Kerry's actions in the 2004 uh, presidential race where he tried to demonstrate his connection with, with common people and was less successful than he might have been. He came across as phony because he didn't have the background to undertake that particular um, action of, of shared values. It probably would have been better for Kerry to look for places where his, um, where his past experiences and his level of expertise went to, went to shared values. So bottom line answer, I, I, I guess, Larry, is that uh, where, where we see this as successful, it tends to be in instances where you look for uh, you look for common experience or common values and go to that to demonstrate uh, to demonstrate demonstrate that you share their values, not where you try to behave in a way that's forced or artificial for you. Um, now, my my prediction, my expectation would be if you look hard enough through the values of the people you lead, you'll find some common points and go to those first. Go to those to establish your um, your shared values. Um, another question from Steve Hayes. Um, uh, Steve asks, um, did your research balance personal leadership and leadership behaviors of large organizations? Were certain conflicts identified? Um, Steve, let, let me, um, I'm going to I'm going to put a little interpretation. I know that when you're when you're working in a, with with limited characters or or fast communications, you, you can't put in all of the questions. So I'm going to I'm going to interpret the question to say, you know, it, it, what's the difference between personal leadership, kind of my my actions as an individual leader, um, and the leadership behaviors that we see or that are mandated in larger organizations? Now, our research generally. Um, not the heuristic study necessarily, but, but the general pattern of research we, we do shows that, um, that followers need certain actions on the part of their leaders. That, for example, let's go back to the three topics that I've talked about so far. They need fairness from their leaders. Uh, they need dedication from their leaders. They need uh, a demonstration that the leaders share their values and, and, and exemplify their values. Um, it, they need that on a personal level, and, and there's, a, there's a large amount of research that shows that, in fact, the, the biggest leadership impact that we see is not the impact of the CEO, it's the impact of your immediate supervisor um, in terms of leadership um, actions and consequences. That said, of course, the, the way leadership is structured or the actions of the, the leadership of the organization do have an impact. And what you would want is for these to be in concert. Um, where they're not, then I, I'll return to that, to that research finding that says it's the immediate leadership that matters. Um, um, sometimes when I'm teaching uh, my, my GIMBA courses, for example, um, there's a, we, we want to pay a lot of attention to how CEOs have behaved. But I'm often at pains to remind the you know, mid to upper level managers uh, and leaders that I, that I teach in the course that it's their actions that actually matter the most, according to the research. Um, if, if you want to know how willing someone is to follow directives in an organization, if somebody came to me and said, I want you to assess that, I want you to predict whether this person is going to do what they're asked to do. Um, I, but you can only give one survey. I would say let me give them a survey about how they feel about their immediate supervisor. I don't need to give a survey about the overall leadership of the organization. If I get two surveys, I'll certainly use the, the second survey to, to assess overall leadership because if the overall leadership is not 
uh, coherent and in line with uh, with the, the situation in which the organization finds itself, it, it will also sap sap followership. Um, where there are conflicts, I think it is our job as intermediate leaders, and, and I'm quite often in that um, in that category, a mid mid level leader. It's our job to go to those above us and to say, there's a disconnect here. Um, maybe even to say, with respect, sir or ma'am, there's a disconnect here. I can't lead my people uh, in this way um, unless you help me out by providing the the the, uh, uh, the higher level leadership that's needed, or, or even uh, unless you explain to me why you're why you're taking the direction you you take in such a way that I'll be able to explain it to my people. So yes, conflicts can occur, and I don't want to paint a uh, an unqualifiedly rosy picture of the leadership role. It's a tough role. I, I once had a student in, in one of my classes look up suddenly about halfway through the, the residency portion of the course and say, wow, this is really hard stuff. In fact, I had a student just the other day uh, writing me about his, uh, his personal development plan, one of the assignments he has in, in his leadership course, who said, wow, this is really, really difficult. It is. Uh, it's it's hard to learn new skills and hard to remember to practice them and to be mindful, um, but it's very it's very important to uh, to make that effort because the payback is so great. Let me um, here's here's a question from Ying. Um, how can I find an opportunity to improve um, my leadership skills while my boss is a transactional leader? Uh, this goes back to this question of leading in the middle. Uh, it's a topic we take up a lot these days in the leadership courses. Um, and in some organizations, unfortunately, I think your job leading in the middle is, um, is to, to almost hold up the roof, which, by which I mean the, the remaining, the, the higher levels of the organization, to make space for your people to perform the, uh, the, the functions and the activities that they, that they need to undertake. Um, I would suggest two things, Yang. First, it's always valuable to improve your leadership skills. Um, it's always valuable to think about how can I learn and maintain my ability to connect with my people. And by my people, I mean not just your reports, but your peers as well. And even, and this is the second part of my, of my answer, your, your leadership upwards. Um, even in hierarchical business cultures or in hierarchical national cultures, there are ways to influence those above you. Um, and we find that these same leadership skills, that things like shared values, um, dedication, and fairness uh, can have a positive effect on how those above you respond to your leadership. Um, you think about it, if, if you were your boss, what would you be looking for? Now let's put aside the personality issues that makes your boss a, a transactional leader and not a, not a transformational leader. Um, but if we put that aside, what is, what is he or she looking for? Well, they may well be looking to you to see indications that you share their values, their concerns. And again, you don't have to share all the values, but where you do share values, it's worthwhile demonstrating that, shared, that sharedness. Um, you might, your boss might well be looking for indications that you're dedicated to the, uh, to the tasks that are, sent, that, that are set for you and your team. Um, and your boss may well be looking for indications that you are listening, that, that the, the listening aspect of fairness is there. So I would say build your leadership skills and, and as you sharpen them, practice them aimed upwards. Um, look for ways to uh, to listen to what your boss says and reflect it back to them. Um, look for ways to demonstrate your, your dedication to the, to the task. And, and my strong prediction, and it's, prediction sounds like it's an iffy thing, this is science. So the, the, the research we've done suggests that to the extent you do those things, you will have more influence with your boss and therefore can make, uh, can make the situation better uh, for the, for your peers and, and your reports. Um, another question from um, Wambiki uh, Fabian. How would you define fairness? Some people think it is treating everyone the same, but I don't agree. What are your thoughts? Um, I'll give you a quick definition, um, Wambiki, uh, and, and then I'll elaborate a little bit. Um, 
my definition of fairness is treating people with respect for their individuality, um, making it clear that you are that you are uh, that you are treating people as people and not as either pawns or um, uh, or sources of uh, sources of uh, of effort or sources of of revenue. Um, fairness involves attending to each person's individuality. So it, having said that, then of course I go along with, uh, with your take on it, which is to say fairness is treating everybody the way they deserve and the way they, and giving them what they, what, what they need and can respect, uh, can, can expect to get from you. Um, the, the equality element, it seems to me, is to not treat people differently when that difference depends on traits or, um, or qualities that are irrelevant to the task at hand. Um, of course, prejudice is not fair. If I treat, uh, if, if I treat a, a white person differently than a black person just because they're white or just because they're black, that's not, that's not fair. Um, if, if I treat um, uh, one of my direct reports who's especially talented, different from one who's less talented, then that's fine as long as the, the treatment in each case is, is appropriate and, and, and helpful to the person involved. Um, so uh, I, I have, you know, there are times when I've led teams where some team members needed more supervision than others. Um, and treating, giving more supervision to those who needed it was not unfair. My obligation, though, was to make that supervision such that it was not punitive. It was, it was promotional. It was, it was positive. Um, let me help you learn how to complete this task so that I don't have to supervise you so closely. Um, uh, and for the person who has more competence, let me let you go and do your own, your own thing because I have confidence in you, but don't let me abandon you so that you feel like I don't care about you. Um, when I teach, when I teach the, the area of fairness, we call relational fairness, which is where, I mean, relational leadership, um, w which is where fairness comes up so much. <clears throat> One thing I, I often say is that the research, my research and lots of, lots of research by other scholars, suggests that wherever there's a division, wherever there's a dividing line, in a team or an organization, people will look for evidence of unfair treatment. Um, now, as, as my remarks have indicated, that dividing line is one of race. They'll look and see, are you favoring people of your race? Um, if the dividing line is one of professional um, discipline, they'll look and see, are, they, are you, you know, am I treating the, the psychologically trained faculty in my department different from the economically trained faculty? Um, and uh, you, you as a leader have to be proactive to show even-handedness across those divides. So yes, certainly treat, treat people differently according to the differences that they need, um, but, but do so in a way that reassures everyone that you respect them and that you're concerned about them. Wow, the, uh, the time is flying by, um, and I, I think I should perhaps proceed a little bit to to some closing remarks, um, uh, I want to do. I want to do two things. First is, I want to. I want to express my gratitude to those of you who watched and those of you who uh, who, who sent in questions. Um, please know that uh, I'm always interested in hearing from alumni, um, kind of my alumni, the alumni of my classes, as well as the alumni of, of other classes at Fuqua. Um, uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. I hope you get a little, you've gotten a little bit of a taste of how we research and teach leadership uh, here at Fuqua these days. Um, I want to say to my, to my uh, former students who are out there, I'm, I'm so glad to know that you were there. I got emails from some of you uh, in advance of the session. Um, uh, it, some of them took me back. I got an email from Jimmy Childrick that reminded me of when I got interested in leadership as a consequence of teaching here. Um, at Fuqua uh, and seeing how, uh, how important the topic was uh, and how exciting it was to interact with, with my students as they led. So, um, so thank you for that too. 
uh, I want to say, I want to invite you to, to tune in to uh, the, next, um, the next in these faculty conversations. Um, my colleague uh, Leslie Marks will be talking, um, uh, and she's just absolutely super. Uh, and uh, uh, you'll see more information about her talk as, uh, as time progresses. So thank you, uh, and best wishes, and uh, again, special best wishes to those of you that I've, that I've stood in front of uh, in the classroom before, but, but best wishes to all of you.